I'm going to be actually kicking off first up and talking about advanced care pla uh, planning. And then Gina will be talking about symptom management with regards to COVID-19. Um, I guess the first thing to say is we've been overwhelmed with some of the data that's coming through with regards to uh, confirmed cases of COVID and also the um, death rate around the world. Um, and we've been sort of looking at this with trepidation, fascination, fear, anxiety, um, and we can see that the numbers of confirmed cases are just clicking on. Um, Australia is almost, well, it's nearly 10,000. Um, but looking in terms of the rest of the world, we seem to have contained uh, the situation at present, although once again, we're quite concerned about what's happening uh, interstate. But what these facts have actually done was in the early stage, looking at places like Spain, um, Italy, and looking at the huge, tremendous number of death rates around the world, it really brought us into focus to very quickly develop guidelines and strategies to improve care for patients who would develop COVID, but then also to step back and say, what could we do to try and reduce the risk um, of COVID uh, positivity uh, and also do some advanced care planning. And I think all these images really got many of us working in institutional health cares to get our guidelines right. I think we were very much overwhelmed with the information. We hadn't been in a pandemic before. It brought out many fears and concerns. And not only from a healthcare perspective, but I can be honest and say, the nurses, doctors, allied health, GPs, residential aged care workers, we were worried about our own families as well. And so we needed to very quickly get on top of these emotions so that we could really focus at the task at hand. If we moved from overseas to closer to home, we quickly saw that there was great anxiety, but those families and patients who did have COVID, there were real concerns, in particular in April, um, stories like this in the Sydney Morning Herald and other newspapers really brought back that concept of dying alone, the fears, the lack of providing that compassionate care that as a society uh, we really um, wanted to and have developed to do so. Interestingly, a paper in The Lancet around that same time showed that the death rate uh, from COVID, in particular for people of older age groups, uh, was significant, anywhere between 3.6 to 5.7%. And this particular article really draws to what we want to talk about. And it said, conversations about death and dying are challenging and upsetting for families. The current pandemic seems to have brought to light the need to be having them given that we know more people will die as a result of COVID-19. Now, through that process, we've actually seen there's a high asymptomatic rate for those patients who are in the older bracket. I'll show you some figures around that. But it really called upon advanced care planning. And when we think about advanced care planning, we're really looking at how can we assist members of our communities to make autonomous decisions now, so that at a time when they lack the capacity uh, for various reasons, cognitive dysfunction, uh, significant acute illnesses, such as the COVID virus, um, but also uh, other comorbidities, they can have appropriate treatments that they feel fit in with their values and goals, and actually say, no, I don't want other forms of inappropriate treatments or investigations. And when we think about this, the way forward really in terms of effective advanced care planning means we really need to know our patients very well. And for general practitioners, I think you really get to know your patients because they're recurrently coming and seeing you. But for general practitioners working in residential aged care facilities, the time period that you may know them is very short. 
We also need to understand the medical illness and the trajectory of illness, therefore being able to prognosticate. There are a number of prognostic tools available, but our clinical judgment is so important. And specific to COVID-19, we really need to understand this beast. What is the symptomatology? What is the comorbidities? What is the prognosis and death rate? And in all of this, effective communication skills is really important. So I'm gonna take you to some early work that occurred uh, in New York, uh, where they actually developed a decision-making tool to assist people, mainly people in the older age group. And the first thing we know is the two major predictors of how you will survive COVID-19, one of them is age-related. And we can see that if we look at all cases and look at the death rate, the mere fact of having COVID-19 when you are 80 years and above significantly increases your death rate. And as does comorbidities such as heart failure, uh, heart disease. So this is death rate in general. And then this is the addition of COVID-19 on top of that. Heart disease, diabetes, cancer, pre uh, and, and no pre-existing conditions. What we know about COVID-19 is it's predominantly a respiratory uh, symptoms and disease that most of our patients have. And very quickly, they may require intensive care input. Up to 32% of patients will actually end up in ICU and of that 15% is fairly significant number will die. But the story doesn't end there because we know that even without COVID-19, for people in the older age group, if they are taken to ICU, there's actually a very high death rate over the preceding uh, 12 months and in fact, there's significant uh, functional um, uh, deterioration and cognitive impairment because of that. So why do we find ACP, advanced care planning, very difficult? Part of it is sometimes we don't feel equipped with the medical knowledge guiding us or the clinical skill sets that we need. Part of the problem is we need to be very honest, but at the same time sensitive with the way we provide information. But more importantly, not to actually dump the burden onto families, carers and patients, thinking under the guise that that's about autonomous decision making. And there's a real error in understanding what our duty of care is determined by our um, ability to synthesize and understand professional information compared to getting lay public to understand that and make very difficult decisions. So we need to actually provide some guidance and facilitation around patients' best interests and what is actually appropriate care in our professional judgment. So let's step back and look at the bigger picture. By the end of it, we want to make sure that we know who would make decisions for that person if they're not having the capacity to do so. And often thinking about what does it mean for you to be able to live well? Are there things about your health that currently worry you? Going forward, if you became more, um, if there's deterioration or not as well as you are now, how do you think your current care plan is going? So often I find that starting the conversation, in fact, reflecting back to yourself, if you've not already had these long-standing uh, conversations with patients, is stating that you are worried, or I can see that you are worried with the current situation. Let's have a talk about it. Tell me what is the most worrying feature for you. And I think a really important thing is to gauge what family members understand. So often there's this conflict, families trying to protect the patient, patient protecting the families. We see that in certain ethnic groups as well. And really we need to get a sense of where the patient is, but also where the family is. So asking about where they think that patient, their loved ones are, gives you two options. The family either recognise the patient is deteriorating and therefore you can move forward in the ongoing conversation 
or in fact you suddenly realise that they have no idea to the seriousness and the deterioration that's occurring in their dad, their mum, etc. And so you can guide that conversation. Your dad is dying. Let's discuss this. Your mum has had a really bad brain injury. I would like to sit down. Let's have a conversation around this. And when we talk about advanced care planning, there are real important things. We need to understand the person as a whole, what their goals, their values and priorities are now, but also later. So what if time was short? What would be important to you? By the end of that conversation, and it could be repeated conversations, it may not all occur at the one go, what is the type of care? What's the type of appropriate treatments and investigations that you yourself first think is appropriate? You don't present a suite of interventions, investigations and treatments that are futile or inappropriate. You want to know the place of care, place of death and the person responsible. Often when I talk to even senior clinicians about this, they're really worried that they're going to upset the patient and upset the family member. Well, let's have a look at the evidence. End of life discussions in fact, and this has been shown over and over again in really important studies, even in Australian context, not just international, that it doesn't actually increase anxiety. And lack of information, the mind, thinking about dying in pain, in excruciating suffering, being dyspneic, anxiety is actually worse. And sometimes patients become really concerned when there is an open conversation that the doctor's withholding information. We know that as we get to know patients, we may understand them better, but often the judgments we make on their behalf may not be correct. Majority of patients, even when they're given accurate information, don't retain that. Um, they don't hear the non-curative. They think of treatment that's going to get them better to improve without realising that there could be functional deterioration, cognitive impairment. Discussions around end of life and advanced care planning always occur so late. Not always, we're improving that. And we know from talking to bereavement officers that if you have these conversations, family members feel less burden, less likely to think that they have caused the death by making decisions that they're not in the best place to make. So information during advanced care planning needs to be given in a very clear and honest format, but not too bluntly and sensitive way. We need to always have a discussion, not only about treatments improving things, but what is the burden? So looking at the burden versus benefit ratio, never shifting that burden to our lay people, talking about things in simplistic terms, but also identifying that during that process there could be grief and we need to be able to support them. Comfort care, end of life care is not about stopping care, it's actually about ramping up quality patient care. So when we talk about the possibilities in terms of treatments, we're talking about attempted cure of a reversible condition, if it's a simple pneumonia, IV antibiotics, some uh, non-invasive ventilation or whatever it is that you might send a patient into hospital, if that condition's going to be reversed. On the other hand, it might be a trial of symptoms to assess reversibility. Okay, for the next 48 hours, we're going to be doing this. If things don't improve, we will then change tack to looking at symptoms, comfort, etc. Treatment of deterioration um, symptoms, ensuring comfort for dying and providing best palliative care to all our patients from the start of diagnosis of that condition right through till the end. Often I get really upset when clinicians talk about ceiling of care, limitations of care, really sense a negative aspect to um, families and patients. So we always want to talk about what is appropriate care, what it is we can do, how we can manage things. So useful phrases, although we can't reverse the underlying medical problem, although we can't remove the cancer, although we can't 
uh, uh, completely treat the stroke, we can treat the symptoms with, with advancing age. There is less reserve. They are unlikely to cope with the stress of going into hospital with ventilation. If we are talking about dying, use the word, name it. People much, even though they may be sad, there may be tears, by supporting them through that conversation, they really understand what you're talking about rather than using a frightened imagery uh, and imagination of what it might look like. I want to now change the focus with advanced care planning, all of those principles to be used no matter what, and looking at some of the specific COVID-19 questions that have come up. And these have been brought in from uh, looking at the literature in places like Spain, UK, uh, Italy, etc. And some of the conversations were, are you making these decisions because you don't have enough ventilators? Is it because mum is 80, too old? Is that why you're not? Um, questions about how can you not allow us to come and visit uh, my mum, my dad? Um, are they going to die drowning in their secretions? Um, so being prepared to answer these questions, I think, are really important. So we need knowledge behind that. In particular, looking at the Italian scenario, they really said avoid sentences such as there is nothing more we can do we need to take them off the ventilator no don't worry you'll die quietly and peacefully with these drugs these drugs will let you die without suffering uh, you must be strong and brave they are really not helpful negative sentences on the flip side you may use these types of sentences we're doing our best to look after you and take care of you this these are the things that we're going to do to help you. I understand this is an emotional time. Anyone would be scared. I can see that you're really anxious. Let's talk about some of the things that we can do to help. Um, so I think these sort of positive stance on a really critically difficult situation um, is really important and it's not patronising. Um, if we bring it back to the Australian New Zealand Society of Palliative Medicine, I wanted to give you sort of the Australian side, and it's very much mirrored by what is happening overseas in terms of those communication tips as well. In terms of visitation, I wish I could let you visit because I know it's important, but it's not possible right now. These were sentences um, uh, articulated when patients couldn't, family members couldn't come to the corona. Uh, uh, 19 wards or ICU if they were uh, corona, um, COVID positive. Name the emotion. This is an awful situation. I think anyone would feel scared, anxious, angry. Be honest. I worry time is short. Let's sit down and really talk about what are the important things I can do to help mum or if it's to the patient, how can we help you right now? Avoid saying there's nothing more we can do. It's a terrible um, sentence. We will do everything possible to make sure your mum is comfortable, no matter what, right through to the end. And engage the family. Tell me more about what mum would have wanted. What is it that you're so afraid of that you want us to send mum to the hospital? Let's talk about what do you think we would achieve by doing that. Those sort of things are really, really important. So I think for all residents um, in aged care facilities, it is so vital to have ACP discussions, uh, to document those discussions, whether it's in a formal way in an advanced care directive um, is the best way to do it and get them scanned into the hospitals that they might come into. There must be discussions with the patient, the family and person responsible. So in a crisis, everyone's in this on the same page and with the staff that are looking after um, the resident, the patient. We need to guide. We don't force patients and families to make autonomous decision thinking that that's shared decision making and that's not. Um, all staff are aware and in times of COVID in particular, I think it's so important uh, to have these conversations. Very quickly, I want to do one other thing and look at 
dying in isolation. And we had huge number, not only in UK, but in Australia, of patients um, being isolated and family members losing the opportunity to grieve with the dying person or in terms of their bereavement. And I think as a society, um, it's really difficult. Um, it really brings that our own mortality into view and it really signifies death without dignity and it's been a really difficult situation in hospitals as I'm sure in aged care facilities, especially with what we are now seeing in Victoria and some of the aged care facilities uh, in New South Wales. These are of um, concern. So what should our uh, response be? And I think we have a real duty of care to look at the visitation policies in hospitals, in aged care facilities. We used it in Australia with social distancing, limitations in gatherings to in fact reduce the uh, community spread um, of COVID and very well. So we were able to flatten the curve. It made us feel safe, but it was the sick and the vulnerable and the dying that were really badly and negatively affected by it. And so I don't think it's that we can have blanket policy and certainly at Concord Hospital for compassionate reasons, uh, we've tried to accommodate um, patients, relatives, etc., but within safe guidelines. And I think all of us need to look at that in the facilities that we're working in. Because lonely deaths can actually haunt us as much as the family members. Um, and it's a real absolute issue. And I think compassionate care is so, so important. Um, the, the lack of ability for people to have funerals overseas and for some time here um, has been really, really difficult on the grief and bereavement. Um, and we certainly saw examples not only in Italy and Spain and America, um, in the United States rather, but also in Australia as well. In terms of community palliative care, although we don't have fully fledged uh, models of care purely for COVID-19, we need to not only look after the safety for the patient, but also for the carers and the staff. And this meant the ability to deliver medications and PPE for staff, but also for carers and teaching them how to do that. We know that aged care facilities have guidelines around screening, infection control, and the ability to provide good symptom control, which Gina will be exploring, is really important. But again, coming back to, if you have a good ACP that everyone is agreeable that with, then that is a really useful tool in a crisis situation to go back to that ACP, because sending a resident into hospital may not be in their best interest because they may die socially isolated. Uh, and we can have a discussion about that too. So compassionate care, I think we cannot throw compassionate care uh, out of the window during a pandemic. We need to regather and think about this very importantly. Um, and I guess the question is, are there other ways to show it the conversation preparation, I think, is really important. And one of the intensivists in the USA said, there may be no way for families to hold patients' hands or hug them while they're dying, but with the care and compassion of frontline health workers, uh, maybe we can harness creative solutions to help them feel some connection while st still keeping everyone safe. So in the last couple of minutes, before Gina talks about um, some of the concepts that we've come up with in Sydney Local Health District in terms of our symptom guideline, I wanted to share with you this really important um, paper publication in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management um, this year in March, where four UK hospitals looked at patients referred to palliative care services. These were very large UK hospitals very early, just in March, in um, the month of March, and 101 patients with COVID. And the reasons for referral to palliative care was for good end of life care and symptom control. There was a higher percentage of men out of the 101 patients with a median age of 82. Comorbidities, not surprisingly, hypertension, diabetes, dementia, 
76, so more than 75% admitted with COVID-19 um, and 25 were existing inpatients who then during their admission developed COVID-19. 95% of them were actually managed in a ward base and six of them went into ICU and HDU. They were referred within four days of admission um, and they only had two days of palliative care. And why was this? Because there was a significant um, death rate, 75% uh, died in the first four week study period. 13 were discharged from palliative care and there were still 13 remaining outside that four week um, period. And each week there was increasing numbers because thinking of March, the numbers were still increasing through April and May, we remember in the UK. This is really important, looking at symptom control, breathlessness, agitation, delirium, these are the things that we know from the Italian uh, and Spanish experience, also our understanding here of the patients that we have cared for, um, what the Australian data is showing that breathlessness, agitation, delirium and anxiety uh, are very common. 96% of those patients were prescribed as needed PRN medications, 58 patients, so just over half, were prescribed a subcutaneous infusion because they had the ability to deliver it through syringe pump. But there are other ways we can deliver. We can deliver it by subcutaneous um, pulse dosing every four hours, every two hours, hourly if required. 37 patients were given morphine and other, and other opioids were used. And look at this, the dose was actually fairly small, 10 milligrams per 24 hours. And I will, we will have another conversation during Q&A about our recommendations and the doses that we've suggested. And a large percentage of those 58 patients actually had partially effective and 13 patients died before uh, there was a review. 23 patients were given morphine and midazolam. Um, so I think this really brings in real life data in terms of what the requirement with regards to symptom control and the types of medications that's required. Um, I just want to tell you that all of you have access to the health pathways and I think they're very important resources that have been developed for Sydney, Sydney Local Health District as well as the health pathway specific to southeastern Sydney. And it really gives you very good information about advanced care planning, but also symptomatology assessment and how we're going to manage these patients in the residential aged care facilities. Um, and I really think these are useful tools to have. So thank you very much and over to you, Gina. Hi, my name's Gina Fletcher. I'm the Palliative Residential Aged Care Facility Clinical Nurse Consultant for Sydney Local Health District. So I'm assuming everyone um, got the guideline for end of life for COVID-19, the symptom management guide that was developed by Sydney Local Health District um, early in the pandemic. So the recommendations for the guide is where de when death is anticipated in aged care facilities. Now, what we kind of accept, expect now is that if someone is positive, that they will go into hospital. But this may not be the case. Um, we've seen what's happened in Victoria the last couple of weeks, uh, and we might not have the availability of beds or resources or because it's not the resident or the family's wishes for the resident to be transferred and we would need to keep the resident in the facility. The responsibilities of the aged care facility is to have the advanced care plan in place and to have it documented in the file. And what we need to use is the speciality guide, which um, we've missed that slide now, is to have that guide and we can use that guide for symptom control. We can go to the next slide. So the symptoms that we're gonna look at today is, as we spoke about before, 
dyspnea, which is very distressing, cough, agitation, pain, respiratory secretions, anxiety and fever. Go to the next slide. Now, as Gary spoke before, um, the symptoms can escalate very, very quickly. So the first symptom I'm going to speak about is dyspnea, breathlessness. What we usually do in aged care facilities for end of life care, and I know from the care staff to GPs, we do end of life care quite well in the facilities. And we write up the subcut crisis meds and we have them as needed or PRN. With COVID-19 symptoms, they can escalate very quickly and we need to be prepared. So what is the guideline that's um, been recommended is that we give 2.5 milligrams of subcut morphine. Now, what is difficult to understand is that we can give it hourly. And we're speaking about the aged population and we usually don't give so many opioids. But what we need to do is to help with the symptom of dyspnea. And if we give it, and after an hour and the dyspnea is still there and it's very distressing, we need to give more morphine after an hour. We can give the morphine hourly up to 15 milligrams in 24 hours. When the resident is settled, we can do 2.5 milligrams fourth hourly. And as was said with Gary earlier on, Usually we don't need to give that much, but what we need to do is to give the morphine quickly, initially, to alleviate that symptom. What we can also do, if the resident is already on opioids, we can increase the baseline by 30%. So evidence has shown that having a background of op slow release opioids does help with breathlessness or dyspnea. So for example, if someone is already on North Span 10 micrograms, we can increase it to 15 and that background will help the over overall symptoms. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Hydromorphone, also known as dilaudid. And if a resident has renal impairment, we use, we use hydromorphone. Now, what is very important to know about hydromorphone, it is five times stronger than morphine. So if we are on 2.5 milligrams of subcut morphine, the equivalent is five times less, which is 0.5. Um, hydromorphone is not as easy to get as morphine. So we need to make sure that we do have supply. We need to have that communication with the local pharmacies and make sure we do have the stock of the hydromorphone. Okay, next slide. Coughing can also be very distressing. And as nurses and the carers in the facilities, we can do some good nursing care, um, positioning the resident, making sure the head is elevated and they're sitting up and not lying flat, which would make the cough worse. If the cough doesn't improve, we do use opioids, as we did with the dyspnea. So usually just one dose of morphine will help, but nursing care does help with the cough. Nebulizers are contraindicated with COVID-19. Now, agitation can happen from the distress of the dyspnea and residents can get very distressed. Um, we need to also check for other reasons that they're agitated. Being constipated can cause, to urine, can cause urinary tension. Pain, pressure areas, just being immobile in bed. 
but there's also a very high level of psychological distress just from the rapid deterioration from COVID and also not having their loved ones nearby and being isolated can cause further isolate, can cause further agitation. So what's recommended with a guide is to give midazolam and you can give that PRN hourly until the resident settles. 2.5 to 5 microgram, milligrams subcut. Now, if the resident requires more than three doses in a 24 hour period, we can start or commence clonazepam regularly, three doses um, regularly, either BD to TDS. So the clonazepam can be given sublingual or subcut. And also what can happen is an agitated delirium with some of the residents. And we can use haloperidol for delirium. 0.5 to 1 milligram subcut second hourly. I understand that these seem like high doses, um, but we need to give comfort and to help the resident. And that symptoms can be very distressing. And if we need to give the midazolam, we need to give the midazolam. The regular clonazepam hopefully will settle them down and um, we can start slowing down the medication. Next slide. Pain. Now, pain can experience pain from existing comorbidities. Um, just coughing all the time, not moving in bed. Um, there's a lot of reasons where we could have pain. And it's also just feeling very isolated and feeling very anxious with the shortness of breath can also cause worsening pain. We have to understand that it is a frail and elderly population and sometimes just an initial dose of morphine can settle. But also um, good communication by their side, holding their hand and communicating what you're doing and how you're helping that resident. Next slide. Respiratory secretions is a very distressing um, symptom. There's stories of residents or patients talking about drowning in their own secretions and um, we need to treat this quite early. Repositioning on the side with the head elevated. We don't want the head down. Um, I have experienced residents with, with secretions, not with COVID-19 and sometimes you can help with the positioning. It does help and making sure that their airway is clear. The medications that we use is glycopyrrolate, 0.4 to 0.8 milligrams hourly if needed, no more than four milligrams in 24 hours, or we can use buscopan, 20 milligrams second hourly, maximum 80 milligrams in 24 hours. No suctioning. Okay, we're in anxiety. So um, now I'm on this side. Anxiety. Anxiety can make the dyspnea worse. It's all about um, the combination of being isolated, the dyspnea, and the situation escalating so quickly. What is important, especially for nurses, to reassure the resident, be supportive. And when you go and do any procedure, you communicate, let them know what you're doing. And just speak slowly and calmly. If they feel that you're anxious, the resident's going to be more anxious. So communication is very important. And they haven't got a loved one by their side. So we need to be gentle and calm that, and calm that person down. 
we use midazolam 2.5 second hourly subcut to help with the anxiety, but I think good communication really helps. Um, fever is a symptom with COVID-19. Um, and this is more basic nursing care as well. Um, sometimes the room can be very warm. You've got the air conditioning on too high. So make sure the room is cool enough. Loose clothing. A cool cloth on the back of your neck, on your forehead, will help cool you down. And we can give Panadol orally or PR if needed. Non-steroidals are not contradicted anymore, but we still need to use caution. Next. So the management of sim symptoms for COVID do require higher doses and a rapid titration, which is not what we usually do in aged care facilities. And that's why we need to really make sure we plan ahead. And I believe the aged care staff do end of life care well, but they're gonna need a lot of support to help manage these symptoms. We need to work closely with the GPs we need to make sure those medications are all written up and we need to make sure the medications are in the facilities and we've organised it with the pharmacies that they're there already and we're not waiting for a couple of days for the medications to come. Um, higher doses is usually not appropriate for the elderly population, but to manage symptoms of COVID-19, we need to have those high doses. And the guideline from Sydney Local Health District is to control symptoms and to focus on comfort care for COVID-19. And there's one more slide. Now for Sydney Local Health District, we have the um, access team number, 1300 Now. Any of the staff in the aged care facilities, if they're worried or concerned about anything, they can ring this number, number and we have the outreach team that will come out to help with any, any issue that's happening. GPs are encouraged to ring the after hours palliative registrar on call if they need help. The Concord number, 97675000 and switch will page the registrar and RPA 9515 And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Um, and thanks, Gary. Thanks very much for those presentations. Um, there's some great insights there into the challenges of trying to deliver care in, in what's a, a difficult situation. Um, I might start off that by asking you a question, Gary, in relation to advanced care planning. And my, my question would be that um, with COVID-19, the standard advanced care planning tools that we use to help people make difficult decisions may not be appropriate for, for, for this new reality that, that we face. Where, where time and uh, the appropriate level of thought and consideration may be lacking. So I'm curious to know whether um, that may force people such as yourselves and clinicians in, in those situations to step outside of their own sort of professional comfort zones and whether you, you see that as a, as a perceived, um, uh, I guess, challenge. Um, yes, thanks, Jason. Look, I think the fact that if we've had prior conversations, and that's why I think if we take COVID for a minute out of the equation, if there's been prior ACP conversations, we really get to know our patient and the client. As soon as COVID steps in, things are working really fast. The deterioration is occurring fast. Symptom control needs to get on top. Decisions need to be made. Is this patient going to be ventilated, not, etc. And so that's why early in my talk, I gave you those statistics, because I think we need to be equipped with the understanding of what the trajectory 
of COVID-19 is. And so sometimes I think we need to be making these very guided, facilitated conversations because seeing someone who's inappropriate to an ICU, into hospital thinking they're going to get to ICU, uh, they may never get out of the ICU. They may die isolated in ICU. So I think that's where, for many of us, it is uncomfortable, but we need to understand the um, trajectory of illness with COVID on top of existing age or uh, comorbidities. Thanks, Gary. Um, there was another question which um, I've just taken out of, out of the question box, and this, this is a question around um, if a loved one in an aged care facility ha has an advanced care plan which has been completed, can that care plan be adjusted in the event that the patient does contract uh, the, the virus and uh, as a result is transferred to hospital? Um, yeah, would you so like to respond to that? Sure. So at the moment, when I'm doing advanced care planning with all my patients, young and old, I immediately bring in COVID-19 into that conversation. So the first thing is if there are existing ACPs, I think we need to take that next step and start talking about COVID-19 because it really, even though it might make us feel uncomfortable in terms of the conversation, it really ramps up the need for patients, carers, families to ask really pertinent questions. And then once there is an ACP, I think those guidelines can really assist making decisions even when a patient presents to hospital and is COVID positive, because that there is that forward planning and understanding of what that patient's wishes have been when they were cognitively able to or had the capacity. But I think this is where I'm really urging all clinicians, GPs, when they're doing ACP, in the current climate, use the current climate to also have conversations around COVID-19. And those conversations need to be realistic. And the realistic concepts are that functional deterioration, cognitive impairment could occur, but if there's good um, pre-morbid status, then good supportive care might actually get them through it. So those conversations need to happen now. Thanks, Gary. Jason, can I just make one other uh, comment with regards to what Gina was presenting? Yeah. I just want to reiterate again that this is not just for someone who has mild symptoms due to COVID-19. So we need to be very careful we understand that that guideline was written for those that are at the end of life with COVID-19. Um, and hence, you know, we need to be very cautious and not utilise those doses or the rapidity and frequency of that dosing in patients who at, are at an early stage of COVID, who are not at the end of life. Thanks, Gary. Um, so it looks like we have no further questions coming through. Just to throw it back to you once again, Gina and Gary, is there anything, any burning points that you would like to conclude the webinar with in terms of advices to um, facilities or, or, or practitioners that may be online? I, I visit the facilities every day, the ones that I go to, and they have been doing end of life care very, very well. And um, this is different. And as Gary was saying, we're talking about residents for end of life care for COVID-19 and the symptom management can be really overwhelming when you look at the medications we need to use. Uh, but I think if you're prepared and that's and planning early, because what I've seen is sometimes it takes a couple of days for medications to come from the pharmacies. So as soon as we have that need, we need to prepare, have the medications ordered by the GPs, and have the pharmacies um, get, the, get the medications in the facilities because this guide is not going to work without the medications in place. And I see that can be a problem. Um, but other than that, um, the other uh, COVID-19, when it's not for end of life, the symptoms are more mild and you're not using all these medications because I, do understand it is scary to feel that you're going to be using all these medications in a facility. I'll just quickly welcome 
Dr. Lauren Chong, who's joined us on screen, who's a, a geriatrician at Sydney Local Health District. Um, so if there's any further questions, um, we'll take them. I think I've just There was a one. question um, that was received by email about um, infection control education. Um, I'll just bring it up. Hang on a second. So the question was that we received earlier was regarding infection control education and the effective use of PPE, the mandatory for the aged care facility to provide education by a qualified infection control nurse educator. Um, so from the RECF outreach perspective, which is the service that I work for in the Sydney Local Health District, um, we feel that while it's the facility's responsibility to organise their own infection control education for all their staff, um, and there is also uh, a list of recommended topics for discussion in the CDNA um, outbreak management guidelines in the preparation section. Um, however, if the facility was concerned that they didn't have access to the resources um, to provide that education, they can speak to the clinical nurse educator for RICF Outreach, who is Carrie Lamb. Um, happy to provide her email or it can be also provided through the access care team phone number and she would be able to help with setting up education sessions for you on topics not just including infection control but other um, other topics as well like BPSD, um, palliative care, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and then there is also some uh, online resources that are linked to from both the federal and, and New South Wales health website um, and in the guidelines to like online education resources for infection control, which um, for example, I know in Sydney local health district, there is some uh, video resources available about PPE donning and doffing, um, which can be readily made available to facilities. Um, the second part of the question was about agency staff and casuals and whether they have sort of certification of um, being trained in infection control. And I feel that one we cannot really uh, comment upon as we have no control over sort of all of the different nursing um, agencies and casual nursing agencies that are out there who may um, be at times hired into facilities. Um, so it would still be a facility responsibility if they were uh, using those resources to ensure that all staff, whether they're casual, agency, regular, clinical, non-clinical, uh, kitchen staff have been trained appropriately in infection control. Um, and, you know, we can't necessarily say that they have or haven't got a particular level of certification, but um, we would assume that all the standard screening practices that is applied to all staff before they commence work such as vaccination, um, travel history and so on is still adhered to. Um, and there is also guidance in the CDNA guidelines about um, in order to reduce the transmission of infection between facilities, obviously there, there has been evidence from overseas that um, staff members who work in multiple facilities have been identified in some cases as a source of outbreak. And so recommending that uh, that sort of staffing structure be limited as much as possible to keep some consistency um, and reduce that risk too. Uh, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think that, that answers that question well, Lauren. This is uh, one, one further question that sort of links into that as well. And it's sort of asking the question whether uh, at this point in time, any care to COVID positive patients in facilities is being done remotely via telehealth or whether it's, you know, um, face to face with full PPE. Uh, I think they're assuming that, that the question is referring to medical care from doctors or power care physicians. Yeah, I'm not aware from my personal experience, to be honest, since we haven't actually had a positive case that we've had to manage in our uh, local health district, fortunately. Um, I think that 
to some extent there has been face-to-face -face review undertaken uh, for medical and nursing care with obviously application of full PPE um, and assistance from the public health unit because um, in the case of an, a facility outbreak there generally would need to be a, a very individualised risk assessment of whether patients can be safely managed staying in that facility for example versus whether there are factors that uh, would guide you towards wanting to transfer them to hospital and it often would require a clinician to assess that you know looking at the pa how unwell the patient is um, what is their advanced care plan um, you know with even the layout of the facility and how infection control might be implemented if the patient is wandering they could you know be infectious to other people those sorts of risks which are very uh, different between individuals and different facilities would probably require some degree of face-to-face -face assessment or if it was to be done through telehealth would require um, a fairly high degree of you know technical support um, and ensuring that there's a experienced staff member on the ground to do the sort of face-to-face -face part of half of the assessment yeah essentially Fantastic. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, we don't have any further questions, so I'd like to wind up the webinar now and I'd like to thank our speakers, Gary, Gina and Lauren for joining us on the panel discussion tonight.